expand upon what I wrote in the abstract and uh, maybe take on uh, this issue that Wes Patterson uh, presented with uh, unusually thin ejecta deposits and uh, uh, basing that on some work that I've done with Dawes but also with uh, a few other craters. Uh, Dawes is uh, it's located in southern Serenitatis. It's uh, about 18 and a half kilometer, eight kilometers in, uh, in uh, diameter. Uh, oops, let's see. I've got to figure out how this thing works. I just screwed up, probably. Uh, yeah, I think I did. I hit the square button. Oh, thank you. All right, let's try that. So, uh, yeah, about 18 and a half kilometers in, in diameter. So it's, uh, now how do I advance? I just did, there we go. Okay, excellent. Uh, so it, it sits in this uh, diameter range uh, known as a simple to complex transition zone here in this work that Pike did. You can see it somewhere between 12 and 25 kilometers in diameter. And, and these craters are right at the boundary between the the strength-dominated regime that's dictated by these simple craters and the gravity-dominated regime here. And so they're quite interesting in that their shape is uh, probably going to be determined to some degree by uh, the pre-existing uh, structural and stress state of the target itself. And uh, that's what I was exploring in the abstract. Uh, but also, uh, this one is, is very interesting Dawes itself because it has some very obvious outcrops of uh, layered volcanic units and they are sitting uh, well above the pre-existing uh, pre-impact surface and so we can derive some very important information about the excavation uh, stage of the impact process and uh, the ejecta thickness on the rim. Uh, Here is Dawes in southern Serenitatis, and uh, you can see that it's uh, nudged right up against uh, Rima Dawes here and, and associated with a variety of other uh, extensional features that are associated with the fluctual response of the load in uh, central Serenitatis. Uh, it has a, uh, a very uh, equidimensional ejecta blanket. Uh, it doesn't look like it's... Uh, dramatically affected by oblique impact, although Herrick and uh, possibly Taylor would argue with that. Uh, <clears throat> when you look at the, uh, the rim topography itself, you see these dramatic changes in rim height as you go around the rim. Uh, and you can see that, that it's basically bilaterally symmetrical uh, in a north-south direction. It, there's a very uh, deep gap here in the north and a uh, similar gap uh, to the south, which doesn't really present uh, any kind of uh, basis for looking at, uh, believing that obliquity has anything to do with this. There's not an uprange or a downrange feature. You can also notice that the, the deepest part of the crater is offset to the east. Uh, slopes also tell us uh, quite a bit. This, uh, the north-south uh, wall, inner wall of the crater, is very much wider than, uh, than it is in the north and the south. I want to point out, though, these areas here, these dark brown areas uh, that are located around the crater. These are almost, these are all uh, related to outcrops of uh, uplifted uh, basaltic uh, or layered rocks, volcanic rocks that uh, that were originally at uh, the pre-impact surface or below and have been uplifted during the excavation stage. And they provide some very key evidence for um, ejecta thickness models. Uh, let's look at a little area down in here. Uh, you can see that uh, in the uh, titanium map here from Clementine, you can see that there's a little block of uh, high titanium basalt that's surrounded by uh, redder basalt. Uh, and, uh, and when we zoom in on that area, <clears throat> we see that 
you can see the layers uh, very distinctly here. So this is a structurally uh, uh, competent block of material uh, sitting really close to the rim uh, and surrounded by blocks that certainly were not contiguous with it at, uh, prior to the impact event. So we're getting some clear evidence of a structural response in uh, rim development associated with this crater. And a larger view of this area right in here is the next slide. And you can see the tilting and structural deformation associated with uh, these blocks. And here is the rim right here. They're right there. So they're very close to the rim. Uh, <clears throat> this is on the northeastern side. And you can also <clears throat> see there some tilted blocks, uh, not quite as conspicuous, but there are a number of things I want to point out here that I think are really intriguing and may help us in uh, further understanding of uh, rim development. Here is the rim. It's quite obvious uh, where it's located. Uh, and here are these uh, tilted blocks. Uh, they're tilted at about 10 degrees. Uh, you can also see a very distinct boundary located right here between uh, the, these units that are the source of these debris, debris flows and this uh, unit up here that is, has a shallower slope. And I would contend that this is telling us the boundary between uplifted blocks, uplifted target material, and the ballistic ejecta, because this is all fragmental material up in here for the most part, and it is not capable of sustaining such a steep slope as the wall rocks that are more competent. <clears throat> and so you can begin to map out block boundaries and, and uh, examine the kinds of deformations that are associated with the room problem that Jim had talked about earlier this week, although in this case, it's probably the outward movement of these target blocks rather than the inward movement of collapse of these complex craters he was talking about. So uh, if you look at uh, where these uh, outcrops are located, they're always, uh, and, and virtually in all cases actually at Dawes, we see that uh, the outcrops are located very near the the, the rim crest itself. And actually, when you measure the height of the rim crest, then the uplifted target rocks constitute the majority of rim topography, not ejecta itself, but uplifted target. And that's true for uh, all the uh, the points that uh, I've measured. and. Uh, I'll just use this terminology. I'll use the ejecta. The maximum ejecta thickness is determined by the highest outcrop we can see. But bear in mind that the ejecta thickness may actually be thinner than that and is covered somewhat by some debris that we can't measure the, uh, the layering in. And then H is the total rim height, and T max is the maximum ejecta thickness. And then I've done this for 20 measurements around Dawes Crater. Uh, these are the uh, statistics, but the one that you really should bear in mind is that the proportion of a uh, rim height that's, uh, that's formed from ejecta is only 27% of the total rim height. And in virtually all models, uh, the proportion of ejecta is about half or 75%. So we're seeing a lot thinner ejecta in this crater than was predicted by earlier measurements. But that's not their fault, because as Wes pointed out, they only had laboratory experiments, some nuclear and high explosive craters, and meteor crater to extrapolate over about three orders of magnitude to understand the, the lunar cratering record. And now we're getting information that's located in here. 
So here's where where we stand now. If uh, Dawes is about 20, 27% of the rim height is ejecta. If we extend that out to Copernicus and use the Copernican rim height that uh, Dick Pike presented, then this is the estimate for primary ejecta that we would find at Copernicus. Now, the reason that it might be a little lower than the measurement, this independent independent measurement here is that because these larger craters have ejecta sources that are farther from their, their uh, ejecta uh, destinations, there's more ballistic sedimentation that occurs. And so there's more dilution of the primary ejecta at the rim of a larger crater than there is at a small crater. And so as you see, uh, what we're measuring here is a proxy for the primary component of ejecta. Because Dawes has very little, it's a small crater, reasonably small, and so it has very little uh, ballistic sedimentation at its rim. Copernicus might have a bit more. And then you go out to Imbrium and you got quite a bit more, and uh, Facet et al. in a 2011 paper, it's very good, by the way, they did an independent measurement of Imbrium ejecta, and they came up with about 3,000 meters. And that's suggesting we get about uh, 740 meters of primary ejecta. So that's suggesting that you've got about 25% uh, or so uh, primary material incorporated into the total ejecta deposit. Uh, obviously, you have serious problems uh, when you're taking one data point and extrapolating it now over two orders of magnitude. And so we've, uh, we've begun with my colleagues, an analysis of a number of craters that extend from uh, two kilometers to about 45 kilometers, uh, all Mari craters uh, located right here. And I'd just like to uh, to acknowledge my team members, Paul Spudis, David Crane from LPI, Mark Robinson and his team, which are instrumental uh, at ASU, and then Robbie Herrick at University of Alaska Fairbanks. Uh, to try to understand this a little bit more, but uh, this is an ongoing project, uh, and we uh, we hope to have uh, the completed project done in about three years. Uh, so, what are the conclusions? Uh, well, uh, Dawes Rim is certainly uh, very variable, and it uh, it's probably it's more likely to be the effects of a pre-existing target structure than than uh, oblique impact. Uh, the areas of uh, highest regional slope are associated with uh, uplifted target rocks. Uh, the slopes are measured over 300 meters or so. Uh, and, the, and slope and other characteristics uh, discernible in these new NAC images may be useful in distinguishing between the fragmental ejecta and the uplifted target in craters that do not have layered walls, such as those craters in highland areas. Uh, we see rim crest ejecta at Dawes uh, that's much, much thinner than expected. Uh, and at Dawes, at least, target uplift is the predominant factor in rim development. And this has important implications for understanding those processes that are associated with the excavation stage. It's possible that Dawes is anomalous, but further study that I've been able to do of six other post mari craters in the range of 7 to 15 kilometers in diameter show similar uh, thickness measurements as Dawes. So uh, it, it's beginning to look like lunar craters, lunar simple craters, uh, uh, have much thinner rim crest ejected deposits than previously expected. If this holds for larger craters, then ejecta thickness estimates, and particularly the abundance of primary ejecta at sample sites, require significant downward revision. Thank you. It looks to me like Dawes might have about a 30 degree uh, impact. <laughs> Uh, of liquidity, uh, uh, which would make its ejecta very anonymous uh, relative to the 45 degree or less, or 40 to 5 degree or more impact, uh, vertical impact. So 
That may be why you're getting the anomalous results. I don't. I don't see how you can uh, you can justify that because there's no downrange or uprange uh, characteristic that would suggest that would be suggestive of obliquity. The the uh, No, because you would expect the the downrange rim to be high and the uprange rim to be low. I mean, if you abide by all the work that Schultz and a variety of others have done in the last 25 years, so, so I, I think it's it, it's easier to explain it as some sort of uh, pre-stress or structural weakness associated with. Uh, with that extensional environment. And that's very, that's what we see at Meteor Crater in Arizona. We see exactly the same thing. Any other questions? So that will uh, conclude this session. You're reminded uh, if you have a poster, take it down before 2 p.m. And also there uh, in the main room, uh, we'll have an opportunity to hear from uh, two NASA AAs um, via webcast. So everyone should make their way over there. Thanks.